Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Rogers, president and CEO of the Texas Heart Institute, and I'm joined this afternoon by Dr. Tyrone David, who's just given a wonderful lecture. It's actually the Fish Lecture for Scientific Achievement at the Texas Heart Institute. And Dr. David's talk was on the arrhythmogenesis of mitral valve pathology, and specifically around mitral valve prolapse. Right. And we're so happy to have you here. Thanks for joining us in the studio after your talk. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. There were a number of concepts that you put forward today, and, and admittedly, you said, you know, I'm going to pose, a, a, I'll create a number of questions that we may not have answers for. But I'd like to just come back and touch on a couple of those. And one was your observation, having done an enormous number of, of mitral valve procedures for mitral valve prolapse, about the scarring in papillary, in the tips of the papillary muscles. And I wonder if you would expand on that a little bit. Is, is that actually at some point a target, a, a, more, a more robust target for surgical treatment of mitral valve disease? I, I don't know the answer. However, once I learned about the, uh, that many investigators are associated with sudden death with papillary mus muscle fibrosis, then I look back at my experience and uh, it's amazing how many operative notes I mentioned that the tip of the papillary muscle was fibrotic, particularly the posterior papillary muscle. So when I look back at who are those patients, by and large, it's not the young women with uh, Bardo's disease, or the older patients with hypertension. Uh, hypertension alone can cause papillary muscle fibrosis. And yet, those patients don't die suddenly, they're not having VF, yeah. and they have mitral valve prolapse, more commonly than the younger patient is the P2 prolapse, the central right. portion of the posterior leaf that drops is called a tangina. Uh, but we can see no association between sudden death and the pathology. So I don't know why you are focused so much on, on uh, MRI with gadolin enhancement, looking for fibrosis of the muscle. So it's fibrotic, now what? Gonna replace the muscle? Yeah. Gonna repair? We don't know if you repair, prevent sudden death. Yeah. The other thing that I that struck me, you showed a beautiful video of reconstructing uh, the mitral annulus and reimplanting the mitral valve uh, in mitral annular displacement. And you talked a bit about a clinical trial that you had started but was stopped. Uh, but but you see, in, in, in that, in, if I understood the what you were doing, you were also doing some ablation of the base of the left ventricle. And, and at least in some patients, had seen a nice reduction in the frequency of ventricular ectopy. And I just wondered, where is that going now? Is that going to end up being something that we should study more thoroughly? Well, two parts to, the, uh, to this question. Uh, the, the displaced the mitral end is not new. I mean, cardiology became aware of it, but we have known this since the 1980s. Uh, start with a pathology from Hopkins. I became aware and spoke to our cardiologist, to be quite honest, a few years later, after his original report, we published a paper in the American Journal of Echocardiography describing displacement. And because the end of displacement, we develop an operation to fix the displacement. In other words, detach the leaflet and reattach inside the heart. So that anatomic abnormality was corrected. But then in 2018, when we review our entire experience, we noticed that some people are still dying suddenly, but were not those with mitral renal displacement. So prospectively, we started looking, well, what's a malignant mitral valve prolapse? So young women with bilateral prolapse and mitral renal displacement. So we do a holder monitor, they do have malignant PVCs, cerebral VF. What do you do for them? Only mitral valve repair or mitral valve repair combined with ablation? And it wasn't my idea. It was one of my uh, cardiology colleagues, Michael Gallup, that came up with the concept. He told me, you should isolate the posterior papillary muscle. Mm. So we developed this uh, ablation where it started at the level of the, uh, just below the junction of the uh, anterior commissure, freeze the whole base of the heart until the insertion of the posterior papillary muscle, and then around the uh, posterior papillary muscle. So isolating that part from the, uh, from the ventricle, so it wouldn't trigger uh, 
a, a, a PVC, was highly effective in two or three patients, had no effect at all in most of them. We have done only 11, so I don't know if 11 patients make the case, but we, we stopped doing it because we don't think this type of lesion is the answer to that problem. And then when you look retrospectively, by moving the leaflet to the ventricle, it looks like we don't know because we have done whole monitor postoperative in every patient, but at least they didn't die suddenly over a mean follow-up of 13 years. Is there a reason in your mind that that would change the arrhythmia substrate by just moving that? Well, if you, if you technically speaking, if you detach the posterior leaflet, you put a bunch of suture in a muscle <laughs> and then move the leaflet to the muscle, you're creating a scar there. You are isolating that part because the, right. the stitching alone is gonna heal by scarring. So it, it's almost like the, the ablation is the same. Uh, the same effect. The only difference is we don't go around the posterior upper muscle. It, it's a bit, as we walked down the hall, we walked by Dr. Cox's picture on the wall, and it's a bit like the way he started to do maze, right? He was cr uh, creating a, the, the same pattern that we do with to, catheters to, today. He was just doing it with a scalpel. I think my thought was in 2019 when Michael Gallup proposed to me to burn the whole posterior upper muscle. Jimmy Cox, the first guy I called, I said, Jimmy, what's going to happen to my patient if I burn the bridge of Prima muscle? He said, nothing. I said, you are sure of that? I have it done extensively. But Prima doesn't rupture. He said, no, it doesn't. Mm. So you at least from uh, a surgeon who had done similar experiment in the past, that ablation of the base of Prima muscle would not cause rupture of the Prima muscle, which yeah. he was right. None of them rupture, but uh, it doesn't cure the attack. So, so now I want to just tackle one other clinical challenge I think that we face, and I'm sure that you're seeing this a lot in your institution, we certainly are as well. There's a real tendency now to begin addressing some of these valvular abnormalities with mitral clip. And it doesn't necessarily solve the pathobiology that you described today. I wonder if you might just tell us a little bit about your thinking about whether or not there is a role to be clipping these valves, particularly in people who have the arrhythmia. I think it's wonderful that you have this technology to reduce the amount of mitral regurgitation with a trans femoral or, or, or catheter base. You don't have to open the chest. That's wonderful. But we doctors often are abusive of any new technology. And we do without much discrimination. I don't know the motive behind all this without data. And then if you take a look at randomized trial, is highly selected group of patients, and suddenly when you go to clinical practice, everybody gets the same treatment. They're not part of the trial. I, I think the reduction of mitral regurgitation, I don't believe is gonna have any effect on these treatments. That's an anatomic abnormality. It looks like repairing the valve the way we do is likely to reduce the uh, dysrhythmia by correcting the anatomic abnormality. I doubt if a clip would do a thing for this. Uh, the clip might be effective in reducing the amount of mitral regurgitation, but not ventricular tachycardia and, and the F. It's not changing the substrate. No, I, don't think so. I wanted to just explore one other topic with you, and, and that is, and I've enjoyed speaking with you over the last 24 hours about your um, ability to translate your observations in the operating room and that creativity to knowledge. And I think that we've got a lot of trainees who watch these, these interviews after grand rounds, but, but I think that you have touched on something that's so vitally important that smart, uh, intuitive clinicians see clinical problems and then develop solutions. And I wonder if you, you've done this remarkably successfully through your career, would you just Spend a minute and reflect on that for us. Well, I, I, this is not my invention. My, my mentors, when they guided me when I was young, what to do. And one in particular, Dr. Bigelow, when I first met him in 1975-76, he uh, used to have a board in his research office with every single patient name from ceiling to floor. You know, use a, a loop sometimes to see. And then first year, second year, third year, for what the patient experienced. You'd write in this, there was no computer those days. Mm. So no no database. Uh, the big quartanas 
I'm responsible for the first data based in heart surgery ever. It was in Canada. We, uh, I, as soon as I started practicing, I hired a computer programmer and using basic language, just yes, no, yes, no, binary all the way, we were able to develop a very basic database for our patients to do what Dr. Big was doing on the wall, on a paper. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and, his, and he was right. He said, if you record what you have done accurately, in detail, and unfortunately, it's never detailed enough. <laughs> for instance, in my operative note, only recently I have mentioned papillary mass fibrosis. I mean, how wonderful to be if I look back in page 1980, April 1980 or 85, had the papillary mass fibrosis and consistently they had a much higher yeah. incidence of sudden death. I could make a point to that, but I can't because my data was incomplete. So, but that prompted 19, 2018 when we reviewed the, for the second time the whole data to modify the database and put in our, our preoperative information and intraoperative information how the whole the monitor looks like, mm -hmm. what the pathology was, there is MED or not, if there is MED, mitral and dis disjunction, how far, how small, how big. So I'm sure my younger colleagues could benefit from that. I, I, I think there's a lot to be learned by following your patients longitudinally through their lifetimes. Yeah. Well, it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you here in Houston with us for the last 24 hours. And we hope that you will come back at some point and continue this uh, dialogue with us. And Dr. David, thanks so much for joining Thank us you. at Texas Heart. It's a Art. pleasure to be here. Thanks Thank you very much for inviting me to come here. Thank you. Thank you.